All right, welcome back, everybody, to uh, our Mayday Mondays podcast. This is the uh, April 2021 Mayday Monday podcast. Uh, last month, you'll remember, uh, was March, was the Irish, right, where we celebrate our, our Irish heritage and talk about luck of the Irish. Uh, last month, the Mayday Monday, we talked about um, Oscar Armstrong and, and the firefighter from Cincinnati who um, made the ultimate sacrifice on a on a road fi- on a house fire there in Cincinnati um, that uh, if you remember it was a, one of their bread and butter operations that uh, was uh, what they expected right they go to these fires a lot unfortunately this one did not end up the way they had planned and Oscar, uh, was uh, killed in a flash over there. Um, again, we learned, we talked to uh, Joe Arnold from Cincinnati. He gave us a great insight into the fire, into who Oscar was and the uh, Cincinnati Fire Department and how they've recovered from that. Um, again, grateful to, to them for, for him for coming on. This month we have um, a, another fire from Ohio. This one is from Coleraine Township. Um, not too far from Cincinnati. Um, and on April 4th of this month, we will have the 13th anniversary or the 13th. It's been 13 years since the incident happened that took two firefighters from us from Coleraine Township. Um, as you'll see, right, if you've been following the podcast here for since we started, uh, there's a lot of connections between these fires, and I think we'll talk a little bit about some of the connections that we see and what uh, happened in uh, with Oscar in Cincinnati, uh, what happened here in uh, Coleraine, and really what happened in the other fires we've talked about uh, with the May Day Monday podcast. So thank you for, for again for coming. This is April. Let me find my script. April 2021 and the anniversary of that is uh, on April the 4th. Uh, real quick, before we get we get into our guest who's here with us today, uh, since the last time we've been on, we've had uh, 10 line of duty deaths in the uh, United States for firefighters. Um, we had a heart attack in uh, Michigan. Uh, there was a firefighter killed at a collapse. He collapsed while fighting a shed fire in Kentucky. There was a COVID, a COVID got a firefighter in Indiana. Uh, There was a firefighter who collapsed during training in New Jersey, another heart attack in Pennsylvania. Uh, There was a medical emergency while fighting a wildland fire in Nebraska. There was a medical emergency during training in New York, uh, Watertown, New York, I think. There was a heart attack in South Carolina. Uh, A firefighter was killed by a stroke in South Carolina. And then just recently, we had the firefighter killed in the collapse of that um, uh, assisted living facility, I think it was, in Spring Valley, New York, right outside of New York City. Um, again, no, that was a tough fire because uh, you could, if you've seen the videos on that and followed that, uh, they had a lot of fire going on while they're trying to rescue the uh, people out of the building. It sounds like uh, there was a fatality for a civilian in the building. And then, of course, the firefighter who passed away from uh, Spring Valley. So again, this month is 13 years since the uh, tragedy in Coleraine Township. That would be April 4th. Uh, this fire took the lives of two firefighters from Coleraine and i um, here to talk to us about the lives lost, about the Coleraine Fire Department, about the incident, about the recovery from that is uh, Chief Alan Walls. Chief Alan Walls just recently took over from uh, Chief Cook. Chief Cook uh, was a longtime uh, friend of the uh, International Society of Fire Service Instructors who, that I'm a part of. He helped us with our basement fire stuff and um, Chief Walls took over from him. When did you start there, Chief? I started here on September the 6th of uh, last year, so a little bit more than uh, six months. Six months. Great, great. So here with us is uh, Chief Chief Walls. Chief, uh, you get the mic now. You can introduce us. Sure. Well, thank you. Um, it's honestly very humbling and, and an honor to, to be here with uh, the, the guests today. Um, I suppose I use a little bit of self-deprecating humor and say I'm the least important person at the, at the Coral Township Department of Fire and EMS, but the, but the most responsible. And so, uh, you know, being the chief, uh, the buck stops with me. But, uh, you know, we have a lot of extraordinary people here who day in and day out do a, a lot of extraordinary things. And, and so in terms of our mission and values, 
um, you know, I couldn't be more fortunate and, and blessed to be a part of um, s such a great place. And uh, over my career um, here in Coleraine, I've, I've, I've just been surrounded by tremendous people and I, I couldn't feel more privileged uh, or, or humbled to be a part of it. That's a great comment about uh, the least important person, but the most responsible. Um, I think uh, you've got a real good grasp of, uh, of your responsibility there as a fire chief. I know as a uh, battalion chief, fortunately, um, there are still a couple people above me. <laughs> um, but you know, you're, uh, yeah, there's, uh, I'm sure that there's the weight of the world um, is on you at some point, but um, you've got some good people there to kind of help with that, I guess. Yeah. I mean, if you look at the accomplishments of the organization over the years and um, you know, the, the great job that the people do here, I mean, we make an excess of 10,500 calls a year and not one time does somebody need to call me and ask me what to do. They go out and take care of business. They do a great job. And um, you know, when I do show up on the scene, uh, sometimes it's in a support role. Sometimes it's just uh you know, watch the tremendous job that our personnel do uh, in terms of their craft. Um, and sometimes I, t I take a more active role. And so, you know, it's, um, it's truly an honor to me to be a part of the fire service profession and to, to be here today to talk about, um, you know, Robin and Brian. That's, that's awesome. I, again, uh, we made a connection through uh, Chief Pegram. Um, and uh, again, another another great person to have uh, right in your uh, phone that you can call. Um, Steve's a, a good mentor and uh, got some good good insight over there. Um, how far away is is his is his town from you? So Goshen is about uh, forty minutes from here. Um, interestingly enough, um, I still work part time as a paramedic, even though I'm fire chief. So I work a couple shifts a month uh, on ALS unit uh, that makes 911 calls for two townships just to the west of us here. But I also do some EMS continuing education. So I go over to the Goshen Township Fire Department where Steve's at and uh, do some EMS continuing education for his fire department uh, every month. Um, and so with, you know, friends and mentors and, and confidants like, you know, Steve Pegram, um, Billy Goldfeder, Otto Huber, um, you know, Chief Bruce Smith here, Chief Frank Cook, you know, I, I could go on and on. It's, it's just, I've been so blessed and, and privileged to be around so many great people who, you know, have in, in one way uh, or another, you know, helped me to get to where I'm at. Yeah. So Ohio seems to be a hotbed for that, though. I mean, um, there seems like there's so many, so much going on in the fire service there in Ohio. You got, uh, you know, you got um, Cincinnati, which you know, the, I we talked last last month with, um, with Joe Arnold there. Um, we have some other friends in the in the town that are. I think that they have some great training stuff going on. I really am. Uh, I'm amazed by the 1403 stuff that they're doing with live fire training. Um, I got uh, friends in uh, Gary Lane and and others in the Ohio that are you know doing great training stuff there. Um, you and, and uh, Chief Cook from Coleraine, who have made a connection with the ISFSI and our basement fire stuff. Um, Ohio seems to be a pretty good, um, I guess, hotbed for, for fire service help and right for, for working with the fire service, doing good things in the fire service. Yeah, and I think if you look at the state of Ohio in general, and, and it's not taking anything away from anybody and to brag a little bit, absolutely. I mean, I think there's a lot of great people, there's a lot of great departments, and there's a lot of great opportunities you know, here in Ohio and, you know, especially here in Southwest Ohio, just with those names I mentioned, um, you know, Steve Pegram, Billy Goldfeder, Otto Huber, um, and, and I could, you know, name countless other names, you know, Roy Winston from the city of Cincinnati um, and, and so on and so forth. It's just, it's, it's just been a great place to work, a great place to learn the craft, a great place to, you know, be a part of. And, um, you know, I, I'm probably going to say it a hundred times. I couldn't be more blessed to, to be a part of all of it. Yeah. Good stuff. Hey, look who uh, chief Halton joined us. Hey chief. How are you? Welcome. Hi, sorry for all this traffic. Um, they had it down to one lane and you know what happens then, right? So uh, speaking of lost track, it seems like um, uh, FDIC has 
found a track, right? We got a, we got dates nailed down. Yeah, we, we've, we've moved to the first week of August, so it'll be the second through the seventh. Um, it's going to be fantastic. A lot of great things uh, afforded that opportunity. Another conference that had those dates canceled. So our previous dates had us sandwiched between our friends from the FOP and another conference, and we were starting in the middle of the week. And, and most of the hotels had been taken over by the folks that were attending those two previously scheduled conferences. So this one opened up a whole week. We regained all of downtown. We went back to our normal schedule. Um, it, it's just a, a huge blessing. It's going to be, it's going to be just phenomenal. And uh, so we're really looking forward to it. It was, a, it was an opportunity that we just couldn't pass up on to have a much better experience for everybody. You know, Monday through Friday schedule, the, the, the facility was reopened. We were gonna have to use hotel uh, spaces to conduct some classes and main program and stuff. And now we're all back in the convention center as we normally would be. So, you know, there's just a, having that continuity and that, that um, you know, that, that space that we're familiar with and, that, uh, and getting the downtown back, you know, just for the fire service was, was a huge win all the way around. So we're very grateful and, and, and uh, we understand the, the, you know, the, the juggling, right? But I think it, at this point, after the last, I guess, I guess, year and a half, folks are pretty used to juggling those schedules. You know what I mean? <laughs> it's not like, it's not like anybody wakes up and says, okay, this is, you know, this is moved. It's like, okay, I'm good with that. We'll make it yeah. work. And if there's ever been a group of men and women who have, have no uh, uh, issue with, um, uh, you know, change. It's us. I mean, you always hear people make the joke about 150 years of tradition and people are progress, but nothing could be further from the truth. The fire service has proven time and time again that we're the most adaptable, we're the most amenable, we're the most creative, we're the most responsive organization really in public safety in the last over 200 years in, in terms of growth, innovation, creativity, adaptability. And, and I think we should be very proud of that. I mean, I think it's a great joke and I get it, you know, the old backdraft line, but it's, it's anything but true. No, you're right. You're right. And um, change is, I mean, we don't welcome change, right? But uh, we definitely can, can, uh, can navigate that kind of stuff to kind of bring our bearings back to where they need to be. So good. Hey, look, um, did you meet Chief Walls? We have met before. We have. We, so, yeah, yeah. Alan and I have been at several things together in the past and, and I'm very familiar with the uh, squirrels nest incident and uh, I, I've read all the reports and I think that the organization should be commended. Um, it, it was actually a very pivotal event for uh, many of us that study decision making in context, including um, another great Ohioan, uh, uh, Gary Klein, another You've got Wright Pad Air Force Base, where you've got Gary, who's been doing a ton of work at the University of Dayton. Also, along with Gary down there is Dr. David Woods, who's also looked at this incident in terms of, you know, the external factors that affect people's cognitive capabilities under intense pressure and, and stress and conflicting priorities and, and, and things like that, too. Things about auditory exclusion and, and uh visual, you know, cognitive uh, exclusion with an inattentive blindness as it's been termed, but it's really not inattentiveness. It's uh, the stress factors. This, this event really had a, um, it was pivotal for many people um, and, and obviously tragic for dozens and dozens of families. And so, you know, but, but from that can come tremendous um, growth and, um, I, I think that it's it's fascinating. Uh, um, I can't, someone <clears throat> someone said something to me this morning, or I heard something this morning that said exactly that. You know that that uh, I oh so uh, someone uh, uh, their signature line um, is iron sharpens iron, um, right? Uh, you know, it, without friction, you'll never get a pearl. You'll never get you'll never polish a stone. You'll never, you know. So, uh, and, and you don't want the tragedy to go to the extent that this did, obviously, but, but from it, men and women like us should do everything we can to capture those lessons. I'm, I'm hearing some scroll. Is my audio okay? I'm just hearing, I'm hearing a little buzz on my speaker. Just give you a bad, it's a, it's a pretty, yeah, okay. it's a pretty cheap. Let's, uh, let's talk about uh, 
Coleraine again. Here is here. I have a map here that kind of draw us into where we are. Right, Cincinnati is uh, down here in the in the in the uh, bottom right of the picture, and then you got uh, Coleraine um, up here. Uh, how big is the is the Coleraine Township? So we cover about forty four square miles. Uh, we got about uh, fifty eight thousand red residents, but uh, during the daytime, it swells to an excess of 100 to 120,000 people. We have a large retail and commercial corridor. Um, we actually do share a small border with the city of Cincinnati, kind of down in the southeast corner of the township. And so, you know, surrounding us um, are, are other cities and villages and, and townships, and that western border then is, is the Great Miami River. Um, and so that separates us from our, our western neighbors. But uh, um, down there to the southeast where it says 27 on that uh, road is kind of where we meet up with uh, the city of Cincinnati at. Gotcha. Okay. So is there a, um, is it suburb of Cincinnati? Is there a lot of people commuting into the city? Yes. Yeah, so we're basically a, a bedroom community. I mean, we've got urban, suburban, and rural characteristics. And so if you look at the township, um, we still have about 10 to 15% of the township that is non-hydrogen. And so um, as, a, as a cadre of our apparatus, um, you know, we have two water tankers um, and, and occasionally catch fires out there. And so, you know, if you go more towards the city, it's more urban in nature. You, you move up a little bit, uh, it's more suburban. And then once you get outside of I-275, it's relatively rural. Um, and that's obviously where our non-hydrogen areas are. So about, uh, let's talk about the fire department here. Um, I was able to pull some stuff off of your, uh, off the, the internet here to show some of, highlight some of your, your, your guys and, and that are doing good stuff. Is that, that's your training facility there? So that's our training facility. Um, I can look out my window uh, right there and, and watch trucks come and go to the training tower. Uh, occasionally I slide out of headquarters here and, you know, I just go over there and stand on the hill and, and watch them do their craft and, uh, you know, sometimes they probably don't, don't even know I'm up there. Um, yeah, that's a pretty nice uh, building there for, uh, you know, small fire department of, what do you have, like five five firehouses and, and 50 people, 30 people on duty? Yeah, so we got five fire stations. Our, our max staffing is 33. Um, All together, we have 150 personnel. So we're a combination department. We have 25 career people and eight part-time people on duty every shift. Yeah, it looks like uh, you got some good stuff uh, going on there. Um, I saw, is there one firehouse that is kind of um, dual role? Uh, I guess there's a, a rescue squad. So down at station 26, they run an engine and a rescue. Um, that's the southernmost station uh, up here close to me in Northbrook. Um, they've got uh, the engine and ladder. Um, and so altogether, we have five ALS engines, uh, our ladders. Uh, likewise, an ALS ladder company. We have that uh, heavy rescue, and then we have, uh, depending on staffing, four to six ALS transport units, and then the two water tankers. And then with that uh, western border being the Great Miami River, uh, we also have a pretty uh, comprehensive and, and long-standing swift water rescue team. So, Alan, when you use the term rescue, just because this is a national audience. That, that, um, thank you for clarifying that, that this is a heavy rescue, extrication, water, things of that nature, high angle. Correct. Right. Yep. Thank you. Yeah, I guess I got to use the right term, right? A NIMS term of which heavy rescue, not rescue squads. <laughs> well, in, in the southwestern part of the country, rescues can be uh, primarily ambulance based and extrication based, which is, you know, it's just every area has its nomenclature, which is fine. I think. Yeah, yeah. No, I, I agree. I think, uh, right, it, it shows uh, their ownership of it. Uh, they can promote it, things like that. But that's good. So um, five, five firehouses, and you say five ALS transports? So uh, five ALS engines, and then depending on staffing, we have four to six ALS transport units. And uh, how far away is a hospital in the, in the township, or do you have to go a distance to get to the... So from here, um, the two closest hospitals uh, are out of the township, but they're no less than about uh, 10 to 12 minutes. Oh, good, good. 
I uh, was talking to someone recently where if they go to a transport, you know, it's like a three hour thing, depending on their closest hospital. And that's just so Greek to me because, you know, it's so every every hospital is close here and uh, you can turn around pretty quick. But uh, that's good. If you're talking 10, 12 minutes to a hospital, then you can get get in and out and, and get ready for for more runs. Yeah, even if you, you know you're looking at uh, a level one trauma center, you know we're fortunate here in in Hamilton County or Southwest Ohio to to have the resources that we do from um, a hospitalization standpoint. And so, um, Children's Hospital, uh, a level one pediatric uh, hospital, is 22 minutes away. Um, University of Cincinnati Medical Center, a, a level one trauma center, is 23 minutes away, and so. You know, we're, we're really fortunate down here in, in this area of Ohio to have the resources that we have to us, you know, from an EMS care standpoint. So you said mentioned part-time. How do the part-time uh, guys work? Just they fill in when there's a leave spot that's that's open and they need, need backfill? So we actually have a rotation form. Our, our part-time personnel work 24 hours every sixth day, uh, or they work 12 hours every third day. Uh, and we keep them on a rotation to try to maintain you know, crew continuity the best that we can. And so we have a few uh, PRN employees, but um, generally speaking, you know, they're on a rotation um, on a particular unit day to, to maintain that, um, you know, crew continuity, crew continuity and crew integrity. What uh, the regular, the full timers, what kind of shift do they work? Uh, they work 24, 48. Good, good. So uh, let's talk about. Robin Brockstroman, Brian Shira. Robin and uh, Brian were the firefighters who uh, we lost on April 4th of 2008. Um, they were both on the first arriving engine of the, uh, the incident that morning. Robin, um, from, you know, from what I can gather, seemed like a shooting star in the fire service. Yeah, so Robin had um, about 17 years of service there. We Hired her in 1991 part time. She was hired full time in 2002, and then promoted to captain in 2006. Um, Robin and I, and, and, and another captain here, we used to teach a lot of classes together um, through a vocational school here, the Oaks, where Robin's mother actually worked at, um, Arlene. And so, um, you know, Robin was a friend and, and um, likewise a colleague, and, and so. Um, I had a pretty close relationship with her. Uh, Brian had about four years of experience overall, had only been with the department though for um, about five months um, when Squirrel's Nest happened. He also worked at the Delhi Township Fire Department part-time. And, and so, you know, I knew Robin personally um, in and out of the department and then Brian, uh, I actually taught his Firefighter 2 class. And so, you know, there, there was that relationship uh, there as well um, in, in respect to the both of them. And so, you know, absolutely, you know, Robin was on an upward and, and mobile track and, and, you know, Brian's goal was to become a full-time firefighter. And, um, you know, as, as we know, unfortunately and tragically, um, April the 4th, 2008 happened. Yeah, Robin uh, sounds like she was very active, uh, active mom, uh, sounds like horse riding, horseback riding, uh, soccer, all kinds of stuff with the kids. Uh, she was a um, award-winning, was it an award-winning swimmer or uh, what was she was into? I know she was active in sports and, and, and horse riding. I mean, you know, honestly, there wasn't a lot that Robin didn't do, um, for, for the lack of a better way to put it. And, um, you know, where her two daughters, Sierra and Courtney, um, and, you know, her mom and dad, Don and Arlene, who, who I know personally as well, um, just you know, just great people, great family, um, and, you know, tragic circumstance. Yes. And Alan, quick, quick question about rank structure. Is captain entry-level company officer or is there lieutenants? So at, at that point in time in the department's history, captain was entry-level, but we've, we've since restructured. And so um, lieutenant is entry-level and then captain and then battalion chief and then assistant chief and chief. Yeah, and it seems like Brian was just starting um, a a, a promising career, right? They just termed, termed it was the firefighters, firefighters. One thing I saw written about them. Yeah. Um, that, Absolutely. Uh, we always want to make sure that, uh, that these things, you know, highlight the members, right? Because uh, so many times 
um, we have fires where we lose people and, and the incident makes the, makes the news, but the people don't necessarily get what they deserve. So that's a big part of our Mayday Monday campaign is to, is to really highlight the members and learn something about them. And I think you just hit the nail on the head. You know, the way that we truly never forget is to remember those names and to remember those dates. Because when we don't remember those names or we forget those dates, then that mantra of we will never forget, um, unfortunately, we've lost sight of. Now, I, I, uh, I'm with you. And uh, that's what that's what we're trying to do is carry on that. Uh, some so many times it seems like uh, the the memory is reduced to a sticker on a helmet or a shirt or, you know, what have you, which, again, I, I, I'm I wear shirts that honor the people who have passed away. But uh, do we really know, you know, who they were? Uh, again, shiny fire trucks are are great, but it's all about the people that are staffing those. Right. The people that 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 uh, you mentioned earlier about you're the least important guy, but you have the most responsibility. So those people that are more important, we want to make sure we don't forget who they are. Yeah, those shiny fire trucks can't go anywhere and do the things that they do well if they don't have the right people on them doing great things. Yeah, so tell me about uh, that morning. Uh, it was, sounds like it was shift change. So at that point in time, the department's history, shift change for the career people was at 7 a.m., and shift change for the part-time people was 6 a.m. So there was a little bit of a mixed crew there. Brian had arrived at 6 a.m., but Robin didn't get off until 7 a.m. So there was a, a bit of a mixed crew, and, and that was one of the recommendations that came out of our final report. It was changing those start times that there would be no mixed crews and, and you know, everyone starting at 6 a.m. Uh, and we're actually looking at that right now, though, from a sleep deprivation standpoint and, and a health and safety matter of 6 a.m., was a good start time. But anyhow, Brian had been in the firehouse for approximately 11 minutes when the call came in and Robin was within an hour of getting off work to go home. And um, it was dispatched as a automatic fire alarm um, and a smoke detector or automatic fire alarm and a carbon monoxide detector activation. Um, first floor smoke and a, and a basement uh, carbon monoxide, if I recall, because the uh, smoke detector downstairs wasn't a part of the monitored system. And so you know, we talk about these uh, events and, and th there's no one thing that happens that causes these. It's a chain of events. Um, so they're dispatched to, you know, what is that routine smoke detector and, and carbon monoxide detector activation that um, wasn't anything but routine. And it was known to be a working fire three seconds before we left the station but there was an eight and a half minute delay in notifying us that it was a working fire. You know, that first phone call from the resident, you know, she stated the house was on fire and that the fire was in the basement. And so the house was 0.66 miles from station 102. So it's a short hop from, you know, station 102 to, to 5708 Squirrels Nest Lane. There was uh, a little bit of confusion with the map book. Um, the operator was told the, the first private drive past the second hydrant. Uh, those two hydrants though, were on Dunlap Road. He got on the squirrel's nest, went to the second hydrant, and therefore had passed that driveway by about 800 feet. And so he had to pro start the process of backing up. And about the time they got to the top of the driveway then uh, is when uh, the communications center advised after a second phone call from the resident that um, it was a working fire. And so, you know, the incident was upgraded to the balance of a one alarm then for a working fire. That house is about 450 feet off the street. And so um, we have a long lake program here in, in Colerain that um, identifies every house that either can't be seen from the roadway or is greater than 900 feet. And so since that house was 450 feet off the roadway and couldn't be seen back in the woods, that private drive had been marked in the map book and then likewise that long lay had been mapped out and so fortunately there was a hydrant right at the top of the driveway they had a four-person company they caught the hydrant they laid back uh, about 400 feet uh, to finally see the residents and um, you know they went out on the scene then uh, with moderate smoke showing so um, in reading in, in putting this back together it seems like the first two companies got there about the same time though was that yeah, so 
the, the backing up and and finding the driveway. Yeah, about the time engine 102 got backed up to the top of the driveway, the second do engine, engine 109, was essentially in their mirror. And so uh, 109 pulled forward then uh, in order to assist with the connection to the hydrant. And then that crew walked down the driveway uh, because we got engine 102, uh, ladder 25, and our battalion chief down the driveway. And then... Um, Engine 109 staged up by the hydrant and the rest of that crew uh, walked down uh, the driveway uh, to get an order from um, our battalion. So um, 102 gets there, that's Robin, Brian, and then the, the third firefighter with a, a driver. Correct. And uh, they met the occupants? So you know, the occupant was there, stated the house was on fire, the fire was in the basement, and that the house had been evacuated. Uh -huh. And so, um, in essence, during the event, um, you know, the occupants sat there in their car in a part of the driveway and, and watched everything unfold. But, um, you know, there was always that question then on behalf of some of, if it was unoccupied, why were they in there? Why were they in there? Well, we have a risk management plan here. We risk, risk a lot to save a lot, risk a little to save a little, and risk nothing to save nothing. They're a savable property. They're doing what we do in the fire service. They were risking something to save savable property. And... Um, it's, it's, it's hard sometimes for others outside of the fire service profession to kind of gra to, to, to grasp what we do and, and the how and why we do it. But, you know, they're following our risk management plan. Well, and, and, and uh, at that time, right, at the time of making entry, it sounds like there was four from engine 102, four from 109 were there, and the truck crew was there, right? So the risk, the risk profile was pretty, was, has now right? That, that scale has tipped in our favor, right? So um, the, the, the danger necessarily could have, been re have reduced, right? Even with the people out. So is it risky to go save property? I mean, obviously we can look back at this in hindsight and say uh, perhaps, right? Um, yes, maybe. But um, if, you know, again, what we know from this going forward, going forward because uh right the hind the, the the windshield's bigger than the rear view mirror mm -hmm. but going forward right we can add put these things together put this thing in our in our ro rescue in our roll index and say okay well uh, i i heard about an incident in coloring where they didn't do a 360 and if if they did you know that maybe they would have seen this so now that 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 risk benefit scale thing is weight is tipping a lot in our favor well, and, and what happened with the 360s, so, you know, they get up there, they get the line to the front door, um, the, the 360 wasn't completed by the, the first two captain. And I think at that point, you know, we think about um, thinking and playing catch up. It was, it, was, it was a fire alarm, it's a working fire, you know, you drove past the driveway, you had to back up, the second two engines on you. There's a lot of things that are starting to add up that, don't do anything to reduce our anxiety levels by any stretch of the imagination. And so um, that line gets to the front door, uh, engine 109, um, that captain, and his crew get down there and he's directed by um, the battalion chief to do a 360. So the line goes in the front door, um, there's a call for water. Um, it goes down the hallway, a 180 degree turn down the basement steps. There's another call for water. And by the time it gets to the bottom of the basement steps, there's a third and very excited and anxious call for water. In the meantime, that second new captain had done a 360. He comes back around to the front door and he radios to uh, the incident commander. Um, and, and this is as near a quote as I can possibly get it. Um, command from engine 109, um, have engine 102 pull out, conditions are changing at the front door easy access around the rear. Shortly thereafter, I had arrived. Um, the engine 109 captain and I met up at what was the Alpha Delta corner of the house because the, you know, the BC had told me, get around back and tell me what's going on around there. And so we have a short conversation. I circle around to the back of the house. Um, it's obviously a basement fire. The windows and the front doors on the basement level had failed. The window adjacent to those French doors had failed and it was basically blowing out the back of the house 
are running all the way up uh, to the soffits on the second floor and running the soffits. And so it was obvious that, um, go ahead. Unmute, Bob. Sorry, <laughs> old people, that's me. So t t a tactical fire behavior question at this point, and it goes to processing all of this information as an officer on the fire ground. As Chief Wells, Wells just said, you've got a, few, a lot of competing, competing uh, things for, your, for, the, for the officer's attention. The, the, the stretch, you know, they backed in, the stretch is completed, they've got the crews ready, another crew's going around the back to check conditions. There'd been a lot of verbal uh, information passed between the other crews. Robin and Brian are up at the door waiting to go in. At that time, by all radio reports and everything I've read, conditions appeared to be very, very mild, very, very moderate. That no heat was reported, the smoke was light, uh, you know, the family's sitting in the driveway. So there's a lot of things belying what I think may have happened. So I think in my mind, as I hear the chief talk it through, and I'm so grateful for you to do this. And I know, you know, the 12th anniversary is just a few days away. So this is incredibly um, hard for you, I'm, I'm sure. But here's what I think, Alan, may have occurred. Then as Robin and Brian are, you know, making the turn for the stairs and beginning their descent, and, and the other 109 is heading to the back, there may have been a catastrophic failure of a window or something. And now, now you've got that cool air rushing in, feeding that fire that didn't exist before. So the fire may have been in a ventilation limited state prior to that point. And now you've got that cool air rushing in, the front door is open. So you've got that, you've got that perfect funnel, if you will. You know, think, think Cherry Hill, think, you know, just think of, a, think of a Franklin stove, basically. Now you've opened the damper, now the air can come up. So that's where the, that's where the water call became frantic, as you said yeah. also. So you know, in our minds, we're talking through this, just it's like an assessment center. Well, then I'd ventilate the roof and then I'd have the crews you know, pull it two and a half. Then I would, you know, it, in the real world, everything takes time. So you've got men and women going around the back, you've got men and women going through the interior of the building, You've got the battalion chief looking at you know, the, the overall lay of the land. Alan and, and, and others are going to the back simultaneously. So I think for a lot of people, they need to understand, as Tony pointed out, that there had been a great deal of common normalcy established just before that, but there was a great deal that was masking the, the real problem, right? And I think it's easy for people, as, as Tony said earlier, in, in hindsight to say, well, they didn't do this and they didn't do that. Well, obviously they thought at the time that they had that well in hand. And, and, and in fact, they probably did, had not, in my mind, had not that catastrophic failure. We don't know what window failed first or whatever, but had that not happened, that radio report from 109 probably would have had, would have had Robin and Brian back out and it, it, we would never be talking about this fire today. But the, the problem is, is that things happen unexpectedly, they happen suddenly, and conditions can, I think this fire exemplifies for me at this point in the conversation, how things can change so dramatically, so quickly, you know, and, and, and how a fire can, um, you know, become vent limited, but still have done incredible damage, and then explosively reignite, as I think this one did. And obviously, we don't have video of it, I'm conjecturing here, but, you know, this happened while we were at FDIC um, 12 years ago. And, and it was, or, or just as we, I think the hands-on training was happening, Alan, if I'm not correct or if I'm incorrect. So uh, a, a tremendous, tremendous report so far. I just wanted to interject that so everybody who's listening doesn't think that, doesn't think that Robin and Brian were battling, you know, smoke coming up the stairway. They were not. The conditions that they reported were, were, I remember Brian, Robin made one report about, you know, light heat and light smoke as she entered. Am, am I, am I misunderstanding that, Alan? Yeah, she headed down the basement steps. She, re, she reported moderate smoke. And so, I, you know, I completely agree with the assessment. You know, that fire started in the Bravo Charlie corner of the basement, which was the only unfinished area of the basement. And once it got out into the finished portion of the basement, 
uh, which was more or less a lumber yard. I mean, there was a pool table, there was a bar, there was tongue and groove type siding that lined the walls, there was carpet, there was drop ceiling. I think once it got out there and it was in that ventilation limited state, once those French door windows failed and once that window adjacent to there failed, um, you know, for lack of a better way to put it, it, was, it, it became a monster. And, and there was only one place for it to go and it was up the steps. One, one other quick question, as you describe it, and as I remember reading the report, it, it, it reminds me somewhat of Southwest Supermarket, the, the Walgreens fire, Precious Faith Tabernacle. As you said, that, that where the fire originated was unfinished. So much of that smoke was going to that void space that was hidden by that drop ceiling that they put into the other portion of the basement area. So you had a, a huge area that, to hold a tremendous amount of fuel and once the oxygen mix got correct, as you said, it, it was an explosive monster. Mm -hmm. I think at the point that they needed water the most, um, they were beating feet back up the steps and they were finally getting water to the nozzle, um, quite frankly. Um, just looking at the radio transmissions and, and what occurred. And so um, we know that third firefighter who was a part of the crew had gone back up to get some more hose because there were a lot of bends and turns and twists to get back to where uh, the air of origin was. Likewise, they had pulled a pre-connected 150 foot um, hand line, um, you know, kind of muscle memory, things that we do sometimes. Whether it would have made the stretch, that's pure conjecture now. Uh, but the point being, um, they got to the bottom of the steps and then needed more hose. In addition though, um, not only did they need hose, they needed water and uh, unfortunately didn't have it. And probably at the point in time that they did, there. Tony, so Alan, and this is important. I think people need to get this context correct. Would you go back to your previous slide photos for a second, Tony? Look at that driveway. That's not that's not the average driveway. That's a driveway to a driveway to a driveway to a driveway. Alan, yep. how how long did you say that drive is? So it's 450 feet from uh, the the top of the street there back to the residence. So it's a football field plus. The two end zones and the the and the and the that that's a that that's that's a remarkable drive, and, and and that you know that adds to the time too then because there was some question about what took so long what took so long, you know by the time they got to the top of the driveway then they had to drop a tail street lay back, um, it was dark that morning and and a little bit uh, rainy. And so, you know, she couldn't give her on scene report until she could visualize, you know, the front of that house. And so in the process of turning down the driveway, laying a tail uh, and getting back there, you know, there, there's a couple more minutes right there. getting that it, look, done. it looks like that last 50 feet fish hooks also. So, and it's, yes. it's blocked by that uh, row of trees. So Robin really didn't have eyes on that thing uh, until she turned that space. Correct. Not until those headlights were on it did she have a view of that structure. And moderate to light smoke, another engine on scene, truck pulling in, you know. So um, we didn't we didn't get these pictures earlier when we were talking because um, I think that at the point we're at now, right, they uh, kind of had were, were in the first floor um, and the they had to go down this hallway here Right. They had to go down this hallway, 180 to come back down the steps to go down. That's correct. Um, there's a great picture here of the the line. So so this right behind me is the A side of the building. They come down the hallway, make a 180 and then and then here. So um, with without water in the line yet and you make that bend, it's going to be tough to get to get the water to the nozzle. Um and that's what it sounds like, right? That's what it sounds like when the, the three calls for water uh, before they decided to back out. Yeah, first call was uh, entering the structure. Second call was at the top of the steps. And then third call appears to be when they were at the bottom of the steps there. And so, you know, it, at no point um, were those transmissions heard by the apparatus operator and he even acknowledged over the radio um, that he didn't hear him calling. And so uh, once the line got charged, though, uh, I would say, you know, what was transpiring was 
in the process of transpiring based upon what the second due captain's report was from uh, the front door upon his 360 in terms of you know conditions were changing at the front door um, to that um, for all intents and purposes probably the basement flashing over and so you know the one thing they needed to cool that atmosphere water they didn't have yeah, and so it, it looks like in the report, the est you estimated that they made it to the X, right? They made it to the X and then decided uh, to go back out. And yeah, it's a little bit of conjecture, but there's some thought that um, that may have been as far as they got, because you could see the hose line kind of draped over um, the, the half wall there in terms of trying to make that bend. And then when they got back to the first floor, uh, it looks like they were going to the Charlie side which put them, put them over. So, you know, yeah. So that unprotected area where the fire originated at is where they ended up at. So, you know, you go to the top of the steps there, turn right, you would go back out to the front door. Um, you turn left and you would go into a laundry room that would dump out into the garage. But if you go towards that Bravo Charlie corner where there was a back door that was left open, um, you go across that floor that was weakened from where the fire originated out, dumping them into the basement. So um, it's again, um, it happened late into Robin's shift, early into Brian's shift. Yes. Uh, so, and much like uh, how this, this does happen, right? We know coming up, there's a anniversary of uh, Kyle Wilson's fire uh, in, in, it was right in my hometown. It was about two miles from my house here where, I, where I'm um, Mayday Monday headquarters. And um, he was at work again for some 20 minutes uh, before this happens. And there is no, um, there is no right planning, right? It's not like, okay, we're going to go to work today and, and, and go to a big fire. We have to be ready um, all the time. We have to be ready. It's a, it's a mindset. It's a, it's a uh, carry on, right? We have to think about um, when the next fire could be the fire of our career or it is the fire of our career until, right. Until we put it out and then discuss it. Um, yeah. And I think we have to, you know, have that mindset of we don't start at 6am we're ready for work at 6 a.m. because there's a difference in those two statements. You walk in the door at 6 a.m., you're not ready for work. And that call can come in at 30 seconds after 6 a.m. Um, we're ready for work at 6 a.m. because at one second after 6 a.m., that call could come in and we gotta, have our, we gotta have our game face on. I mean, Brian was in the door for all of 11 and a half minutes when that call came in. And so uh, he had his gear ready, he had his, uh, accountability tag on passport. And so, you know, I, I think that, um, you know, we always have to assure that we, we're just not there at six, that we're ready to go at six or seven or eight or whatever our start time is, because um, one second after um, we could get the call. And if you're not ready, you're not ready to go to work. So April 4th, um, 2008, since then, um, what has been uh, the recovery? What has been some of the things that, that have uh, you've reflected on and maybe um, adjusted from this fire for the Coleraine Township Fire Department? So, um, you know, I can recall that morning um, being inside of Command 400, which is the Hamilton County Fire Chiefs Association Mobile Command Unit. And, you know, Chief Smith uh, at that point in time telling us, you know, we're going to find out what happened, um, you know, we're basically going to bear our souls and, and we're going to put forth measures to ensure that this doesn't happen or we can try and prevent it from ever happening again. And so right off the, right off the bat, uh, we established a preliminary report committee. Um, Tom Camp from the Cincinnati Fire Department, uh, he was a district chief at the time. He was uh, one of the committee advisors. Uh, and, and, and played a, a you know a huge role um, in, in a lot of this, and so our preliminary report came out um, July of 2008, uh, just a, a few short months uh, after Squirrel's Nest, and it it identified 12 different action items that um, 
we were going to work on and, um, you know, comprehensive review of structural firefighting tactical procedures, you know, at that point in time in our department history, we had no standard operating guidelines for structural firefighting operations. And so, you know, for years we had basically relied upon our experience and training. And so, you know, that was one of the things that got asked, well, why didn't they do a 360? Well, generally speaking, it was a heuristic or a rule of thumb that they would do a 360. It wasn't codified anywhere. Um, not that it couldn't or shouldn't have been done, but there were no guidelines that existed. Um, you know, in particular, we didn't have anything in, in regards to basement fires. Um, we enhanced our command officer and support notification to, to get more help there sooner. We uh, supplemented our first alarm response. Um, we added another engine and another ladder, purchased additional thermal imaging cameras. Um, we looked at headsets for our apparatus operators uh, because the operator didn't hear them calling for water. Looked at communications, looked at the SCBA and uh, portable radio interface technology, which we now accomplished with uh, new packs and Bluetooth. Um, accountability, um, some additional training in uh, the incident management simulator. And then likewise, you know, continued evaluation of our personnel for um, critical incident stress. And, you know, any of us that have been a part of one of these situations knows that the person and the organization that we were before we arrived is different than the person and the organization is after we leave. And there's a you know significant responsibility to assure that um, we, we look out for one another and it's, it's honestly okay to say that we're not okay. You know, it's, it's soon to be 13 years. Um, I have no doubt in my mind that there are persons still here that, um, suffer to a certain degree from the effects of what happened that day. You know, it, it was, it's, it's tragic. It's, it's um, life changing and um, it's, uh, it's, it's, it's lifetime lasting. I mean, you know, you, you, you have two choices. Uh, you learn to manage it or it learns to manage you in terms of, you know, what happens in, in these situations. And, um, you know, I can say through my own ups and downs and struggles for the, the better part of a decade, you know, the, the, the regret, the guilt, um, you know, the frustration, the sorrow, shoulda, woulda, coulda, what if I did this? What if I did that? Should we have done this? Should we have done that? It will eat you alive. Um, and, and honestly, um, it ate at my soul. And um, I'm not the only one um, here and, and, and elsewhere who has experienced that. And then those that have know exactly what I'm talking about. If, if you don't find a way to manage it, uh, it will manage you. Uh, and for me, for a while, it did. Um, our final report then, so moving from, you know, the preliminary report to the final report, we um, established a final report committee. And that report came out then in June of 2010. Uh, contained within it were 51 different findings and 72 recommendations to um, improve firefighting operations and, and to hopefully prevent, you know, something from like this from happening, not just here, but the fire service as a, as a whole. And uh, actually, you know, there's that report, uh, 450 some pages. And so here's the importance of these reports. And we'll talk about it a little bit later. And it's open to page 142 right now, recommendation 8.2B. We had a two alarm fire just a couple of weeks ago in an apartment building. I had hopped in and we had some communications and issues inside of the battalion chief's car. And I said, you know what, we're done with this. We're going to put in headsets. We're going to do it right. And there was a conversation out here about the why's, the what, for's, and how comes, and maybe even a little bit of money. And I said, hang on a minute. I went and found the report that still sits on my desk. I turned to page 142 and said, this is why we're going to do it. And that's all the rationale I need. So, you know, something that was written almost 13 years ago still is important in this organization because we're able to refer to that and go, here's the rationale that we need to do what we need to do. Um, and that's how important that's been now. I'm trying to remember, um, Billy Goldfeder wrote an article in uh, Firehouse Magazine about an incident that happened in Defiance, Ohio. Um, and it was entitled, Lessons Learned at One Fire Prevent a Similar Tragedy at Another. 
So February the 8th, 2009, we're talking about the preliminary report, Defiance Ohio has a structured fire. Prior to that, their first due officer didn't do the 360. Their first arriving chief officer did. Um, after having, you know, look at our preliminary report and, and study some things, they changed uh, their policy in terms of who did the 360. And at that fire, the company officer ended up doing the 360. And, and shortly thereafter, um, the first floor collapsed into the basement. And um, they were someplace that they probably, they were someplace other than where they would have probably been had they not reflected upon, you know, the report. And so, you know, we look at legacies and, and we talk about um, how, to, how to honor those being honest and, 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 and upfront about this is what we could have done better, or these are things that we should have done, helped another organization to change a policy that in all likelihood saved some of their firefighters' lives. And I, I can't think of a better way to, you know, honor Robin and Brian's legacy than to be able to, you know, quantitatively say um, what we learned there was put into place someplace else and may have likely saved somebody's life. No, I, I could uh, let you keep going, Chief. Um, this is what Made a Monday is about, is, um, and hopefully, right, um, you used the report on a fire recently in Coleraine. Um, yep. What I want is that someone in, um, I don't know, Idaho could use Coleraine's report so they don't have to experience, right? I, the fire service is so tough because it, it didn't happen to me. So it, 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 it can't happen here, right? And not, it's not until it does happen here where we realize, wow, I, you know, I, I think I saw this before. So let's, let's take that active, proactive role, right? And, and using, the, I think this would be cathartic for, for people like you were talking about that live with the burden of this incident that happened in 2008, right? That uh, need to, they need something to, uh, to focus their energy on. Well, here it is, right? Let's take what we learned from the deaths and let's, let's affect other people because it, it is so tough in the fire service where, you know, it, everything is local, which is good, right? We want, it to, we want our local to, to respond to how our, our area and how, what we, what's presented in our area. But what these fires, this happened in a two-story colonial that everybody in America has. I mean, unless you're just a, a concrete jungle that, that is nothing but high rises and that kind of thing, which there are fire departments like that. You know, hold on for a second. We're gonna we'll probably have a Mayday Monday that talks about a fire that 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 a uh, firefighter died in that same situation. But this one is one that everybody can kind of relate to, right? For this is you had you had something that that everybody four people on a fire truck, which is good. There are going to be Mayday Mondays where there's two people on that fire truck, right? So that's something maybe they could learn from. But but everybody can relate to this. They use you used uh, inch and three quarter hose lines. You had uh, a couple of engines and a ladder truck. You had a, a 2,000, 2,500 square foot single family colonial type five building, right? That everybody can kind of relate to. So this happens. Uh, the fire behavior is, is typical for a basement fire, right? What we're learning now from thankful to, to uh, other, other partners in the fire service that have done the research for us. But we also, if you don't want to believe the research, Look at Coleraine Township's uh, incident. Look at Cherry Road. Look at um, Philadelphia. Look at um, it's countless of, of basement fires that behaved the same way that the fire in the research behaved. So these, these things all add up. But if you don't want to believe the UL stuff, that's fine. Look at this. Look at this incident. And these reports are yeah. out. Step one yeah. is somebody wrote the report. Now it's up to you to open the report and digest the information that's in it. Well, we're gonna feed it to you in Mayday Monday. So it's here, you can click on the links, it'll be there for you. NIOSH report, also the Coleraine Township report will be there for you. So you can look at this thing and honor these firefighters by learning about what happened. Yeah, and both of those reports, the preliminary report and the final report are still available on our township webpage under, under Fire EMS. And so, 
they're readily accessible to anybody who searches for it. Uh, and likewise, as far as an OSH report, have to search for it, and it's readily available too. And, and so, you know, these reports, um, both of ours and, and the NASH report, can be found right now with a simple Google search. Um, and, and if I can, real quick, you know, basement fires here in Southwest Ohio. So, basement fires have been very unkind to us in Southwest Ohio. Uh, March 2001, Bill Ellison fell into a basement in Miami Township, which is immediately to the south of us. Uh, some of our units were there, and, and I worked with Bill. Um, part-time at the Western Joint Ambulance District. Bill was a master of his craft um, and, and Bill fell in uh, to the basement and then succumbed to his injuries. We had a close call in 2003 where a lieutenant and a firefighter fell into a basement here in Corian Township and, and I was at that fire and, and interestingly enough the date of that was March 21st 2003 and that date should ring a bell because just last month you talked about March 21st 2003 in the city of Cincinnati. And then we had uh, April the 4th, 2008 with Robin and Brian. And then Patrick Wolterman fell into a basement in the city of Hamilton in December of 2015. Patrick was in my first uh, recruit class as a division chief of training here. And so, you know, for me, when we talk about, about basement fires, it's very personal. You know, I've, I've had friends and colleagues uh, and, and been a part of, you know, some of those things. But I will say, you know, we had a basement fire in 2016 that everything that we learned from Squirrel's Nest came to fruition. Um, and in that particular incident, um, we had our standard operating guideline. Um, our captain utilized it appropriately. Uh, he initiated a transitional attack and, um, you know, looking at the fire lit in that basement, uh, the engineered floor joists were burned in two. And so, you know, back up nine years earlier, we would have been on that floor looking for the basement steps. Instead, this time, he had headed around back with all intentions of going through the, the, the basement door. The homeowner had given him the key to it and said, the, the building's evacuated. Uh, the basement door is closed. Uh, there were some issues with the wind that day, but a window failed. There was a pressure change as he was unlocking the door that the window blew and that window that he, door that he was standing at his eyebrows were singed off he orders the transitional attack within a matter of minutes they got uh, the, the bulk of the fire knocked down within about 10 minutes they have the fire under control um, and, and so everything that we had learned and put in place and worked on since april the 4th 2008 really came to fruition that day and uh, I think we would say that um, once again, we honored Robin and Brian's legacy by doing so. You talk about Ohio and basement fires. Um, we would be remiss if we didn't talk about Columbus and uh, John Nance. Um, again, um, Nance, Nance died in the basement of a commercial building um, in Columbus, fell through the floor. Thankfully, Columbus Fire Department, right, those guys, um, those guys in their recovery uh, came up with uh, handcuff knots and and rope technique to remove them, remove someone from a from a basement. Um, so that's that's kind of what this month's skill drill is. Um, and I want to show everybody um, the graphic for the this month's Mayday Monday. Uh, this month's Mayday Monday is a different take on some rescue options on basement fires. Again, a lot of us know how to do the John Nance uh, Columbus drill with the ropes and you tie them and you pull them up and stuff. Another option, and, and the John Nance thing is kind of a rapid intervention skill, right? The team would come in with ropes. Uh, this scenario here, perhaps um, if you think uh, maybe your crew is advancing the hose line into the, into the building and one of the crew members falls through, the, through a hole in the floor, uh, immediately you can jump into action with your hose and maybe rescue that member. So this, this month's skill drill is a, a basement fire rescue option where you use the hose to bring that member back up. So um, real quick, you, you take the hose, you, you, you extend it over the hole, you make a bite with the hose, you drop that bite down into the hole. Uh, I got some more pictures here, let me see. I got the, so you take the, the, the firefighter fell through the floor, you take the hose here, you extend it, you, you push a bite of the charged hose line down into the hole. The member uh, in trouble down below straddles the hose. He can get on top of it. And then the members upstairs here, you can see they kind of uh, work together 
to pull the hose up. If, if you have it, if it's charged, right, it's pro it wants to straighten out. So as you pull that thing up, the member can come up and, and, uh, and evacuate and get up to the, to the first floor level, if you will. And then uh, the crew can, can get out. So it's another option for, for rescue options for a basement or below grade rescue. Um, these are just some, some skills, some pictures that we uh, had an acquired structure in my town here and we were able to, to practice that. So get out uh, this month, practice that thing. Uh, this is some pictures. If you would, when you practice it, send in some pictures to uh, have a mayday.monday at dc.gov website or an email address where you can send some pictures. Here's some pictures of uh, my battalion here conducting last month's, this is last month's Mayday Monday uh, skill. Oops, sorry. I uh, was hoping to play that, but I got a video. It's not going to work. Um, it, it, that was last month's Mayday Monday skill, and you can practice that. This month, sorry, let me stop share. This month, practice the uh, the hose, push it down in, send me some pictures. Again, some other options to kind of add to your uh, rescue roller decks or your firefighting knowledge. So if this was to happen and conditions are right, uh, you could you could bring somebody back up. Um, Chief Walls, I uh, think as we finish up here, I just uh, want to wrap up with maybe two or three <clears throat> important takeaways from um, the, the incident uh, that, that you might be able to provide to the, to the uh, audience here. Um, I, we talked about a bunch and all the, everything that we talked about is important, but I'd just like to kind of wrap it up with that. If there's a couple of nuggets they can take with them. Um, yeah. First and foremost, uh, routine calls for service. They don't exist. You know, this was a first floor automatic fire alarm activation and a basement carbon monoxide detector activation. And about 22 minutes later, they had fallen into the, the basement and perished. Routine calls should never exist in our vocabulary ever. But, and sometimes, unfortunately, uh, they probably exist a little bit too much more than they should. Um, secondly, you know, we have a responsibility and an obligation uh, to our personnel and to the fire service as a whole um, to ensure that there are no history repeating events. And, and, and we do that by investigating near misses, close calls, and line of duty deaths and, and putting out there for everyone to see, regardless of how, how painful it may be for us, so that they can learn from us so that nobody has to experience what we've experienced or another organization has. Uh, and finally then, you know, today sums up what I would say that the, the third bullet point is here, you know, in order to honor their legacy and sacrifice, uh, we have to mean what we say and say what we mean when we say we will never forget. And so it's almost 13 years later and we're still talking about Robin and Brian and we're still honoring their legacy um, by doing this today. And so um, there's a lot more I could talk about, but I think the, there's three things for the, the folks out there. And that's, that's really good. And I, I could tell that, um, it's still, it's still affecting uh, you, and um, hopefully that is uh, something that the Coleraine Township, the new members in the fire department there that came on since this has happened, uh, they could reach out and, and you, know, you, can, you can honor their legacy by continuing uh, to, to carry on the, the lessons learned from that fire so that nobody else has to experience the same thing. Chief Halton, uh, any final words? No, I, well, I'd just like to add Thank you to Chief Walls and, uh, you know, our condolences at this time of year, especially for, you know, what your organization and yourself are going through. And, and to the Chief's point, uh, basement fires, you know, are throughout the entire United States, they're one of the most difficult events to deal with. And I think one of the things to keep in mind, as the Chief said, there are no routine operations or jobs. And irrespective of what type of floor you think you may be operating on, do not for one moment think that just because you read somewhere that because it's a legacy, you know, plank flooring that you've got 23 minutes to operate because the fire may have been burning for 45 minutes or 35 minutes or we don't know the burn time prior to arrival. Uh, you know, so all of those things is are there, although fires may have characteristics or items that are similar to the chief's point, they all have things that are unique. And it's those, it's those differences 
that can cause fire behavior to be radically different, that can cause, you know, um, unforeseen, they're the, they're the knowns, the unknowns, and the unknown unknowns, you know, so you're, you're always up against millions and millions of variables, and, and how they come together and the timing of them uh, it, it can make all the difference in the world. So, you know, although we, we do pattern recognition and we, we get excellent at reading things, you know, it's always good to have a more collaborative conversation and support, I think, for all the command level officers and decision makers on the fire ground. And, and, um, and that's tough, right? It's, it's really tough. And I would just add, be very careful about hindsight bias because we're, we're so quick to make, you know, uh, observations and, you know, blurt out statements, which is why I'm, I detest antisocial media. I, I think that the, you know, I think all those pro, all those all those platforms should have a two day delay on anything somebody puts up that they can take it down within 48 hours, because you know these people see something and they right away assume you know that this is what it is or that everybody knew the ending and they blurt out some really hurtful comments sometimes some really painfully um, destructive comments that you can't take back because of the permanence of those you know, those platforms. Now, we didn't have the interweb as we do today when, when we lost Brian and Robin. Um, but even in retrospect, you know, even sometimes today, I see people say things like, I'm, I'm like, are you kidding me? <laughs> you know? So I think the, the old adage that our moms and dads taught us when we were kids is to never judge another person until you've walked a mile in their shoes. And, and what that really means is imagine if you were there, imagine if you were Robin, or imagine if you were that second two officer going around the back, imagine if you were Chief Walls, and, and, and take that perspective and try to run that through your head. You know, what were they trying to accomplish? What were they trying to do? What did they know to be true? What did they think to be true? You know, what was their, what was their emotional set? What was their, you know, and all of that matters, you know, and, and then, and then when you roll up to a job that's similar, you're going to say, okay, if I was Chief Walls, what would I do right now? Okay, <laughs> you know, and, and, and it may be, okay, I'm going to do, you know, exactly what I thought I was going to do, or it may be, wow, wait a minute, you know, maybe I want two lines, maybe I want, you know, maybe I don't want to go in it, maybe I don't, li you know, maybe I don't like this at all. And so, um, you know, I've had the great uh, opportunity to meet Robin's mom, and absolutely lovely lady. And I never had the pleasure to meet Robin or Brian. Um, but through these reports, you feel as if you come to know them. And I always appreciate Tony showing their pictures because the eyes are the window to the soul. And, you know, as you look into the eyes of those two uh, beautiful people, you see nothing but kindness. You see nothing but um, love. And, and I know that what Coleraine has done and what Ohio has done and what the American Fire Service has done is to respect that legacy. And, and thank you, Tony, for, for uh, looking at this event. And, and thank you all out there for sitting with us. And I, 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 I urge you to take the chief's advice and download those reports and put them on your desk so that you can read them and refer to them. And, and you know, Maybe not all the recommendations are germane to your organization or, or possible, but maybe some of them are. And so, you know, they, I, I can't remember who said it, so I apologize. But someone once said, a wise man learns from his experience, but a genius learns from the experience of others. Now, I'm no genius, but I would hope that, you know, um, I would hope that I'd be wise enough to try to learn from others' experiences. Thank you, Chief, for being with us today. Thank you, Tony, for allowing me to be here. Thank you. No, uh, thank you for, for jumping on, Bobby. And I just want to kind of echo that, right? So we have lots of, we have these reports. We can use those experiences to kind of help help drive our decision making. You can also use, again, there's, there's there, fire services got lots of information nowadays. The UL, uh, UL and ISFSI joined together. They put together that understanding and fighting basement fires classes. We, we use uh, Coleraine Township as one of the, one of the case studies in the, in the class. Um, it's really good stuff. They have come up with an online class where you can learn more about these things. You can learn about the fire dynamics. You can learn about the types of basements. 
You can learn about the research itself, different types of uh, alternative ways to get water into the basement. And um, you can do that, you know, from the same screen that we're, you're watching this, this show from. So get, do that. And uh, in addition to do the skill drill this month, it's another, another way for you to kind of, you know, maybe find a way to rescue someone that, that did fall into the basement or into a below grade area. Um, these are these things that add up because uh, like, like Bobby mentioned, the recognition prime decision making, you need to load up the, the slide trays. So when the incident happens, you have seen it before. So practice this stuff before you need it. That's kind of the goal of this May Day Monday thing. Thank you, everybody, for coming in. Chief Walls, it was great to meet you. I really appreciate you you coming on. Um, you guys, Coloraine has done a great job in honoring the memory. Uh, you bared your soul in the reports, um, and you have um, evolved from that, which is great, good stuff. Bobby, thank you. Uh, Fire Engineering, thank you for hosting this, uh, this May Day Monday again, and uh, we'll see you next month. Have a good April. Thank you.